Bien, bonjour à tous. Euh, nous avons le très grand plaisir aujourd'hui d'accueillir pour un mois au Collège de France les professeurs Outa Fris et Chris Fris, dont vous connaissez tous euh, les travaux. Euh, je vais résumer brièvement et aujourd'hui je ne parlerai que de Outa. Et vous avez les titres sous les yeux. Vous voyez que les deux premiers exposés seront donnés par Outa Fris et les deux suivants par Chris Fris avec un, un tout petit changement dans le programme par rapport à ce qui a été annoncé au départ. Euh, mais euh, nous allons suivre néanmoins l'ordre des abstracts qui, ont, qui sont présents sur le site du Collège de France. So, Uta Fris is a, a professor, a research professor actually at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, and she's also, of course, emeritus professor from UCL, uh, University College London, where she did much of her career. Um, she is uh, internationally uh, renowned, of course, as being uh, probably the foremost uh, developmental cognitive neuroscientist in uh, the world for her work on dyslexia and for her work on autism, of which she is the uh, best specialist, I would say. Uh, she is the author of several books on autism. There is one of them has been translated in French and is still available uh, in a new edition. It's called L'énigme de l'autism, chez Odile Jacob. But in fact, she has three books in English on autism. Only one of them is translated, keeping up with the growing research in this area. And she also published a book on uh, the links between education and neuroscience, together with Sarah Jane Blakemore, uh, which is called The Learning, uh, the learning Brain. Simple. Um, so, uh, bo all of these books are extremely interesting. I should mention that Uta is also the author recently of a report to the Royal Society about the consequences for education of uh, current brain research and uh, cognitive research. Uh, Uta has won many international prizes. I will not mention them all. I will just mention that uh, among them is the Jean-Louis Signoret Prize from the Ibsen Foundation. Uh, she also has the privilege of having the three Uh, consonants as attached to her name, FRS, which is Fellow of the Royal Society, which is an enormous distinction. And she's the member of several other academies, including the British Academy. Um, what else should I say? I think I should stop the list, probably, and uh, welcome you and let you speak today. The title of the talk is What is Social About Social Cognition? Thank you very much, Uta. Thank you very much, uh, Stan. This was uh, in incredibly flattering, and, and I hope you didn't listen too carefully to all this. So uh, just to tell you that um, the title today isn't actually Developments in Theory of Mind. Also, I will say a little bit about Theory of Mind, but this is a title which seemed to be the right thing to do as the first lecture for the four lectures that uh, Chris, Frith, and I are, are doing this month. So I hope you're not going to be too disappointed not to hear a whole talk about uh, new developments in theory of mind. Um, I would like to consider what we mean by cognitive and social and cognitive social neuroscience. So first of all, what is cognitive? And I would maintain that that's everything the mind does, the brain does. In fact, we should not really make uh, this artificial distinction as if there was you know, a, 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 a dual state. So some of the um, uh, activities of the mind, of the brain, uh, are listed here. And they, I have to say, are mostly completely below our awareness. Just like this iceberg, most of the interesting things go on underneath. The most cognitive processes are completely implicit, unknown to us, but some are explicit, and that's quite interesting. Now, what do we mean by social? <laughs> um, of course, we mean communicating and copying and interacting, and we have to really then ask, what is both cognitive and social? And I would again say almost everything the mind-brain does. And one of the most important things perhaps we can uh, say about this is learning, just not ordinary learning alone, but learning by observation. And again, here are some of the activities that are both social and cognitive. And uh, this list, this short list, um, is probably underpinned by the brain's mirror system, which I will talk a little bit about. And this list is uh, probably underpinned mainly by the brain's mentalizing uh, system, uh, which I will also talk a little bit about. 
Now, obviously, human social cognition is the end result of a very long process um, of evolution, and we can find out about underlying mechanisms that enable social processes through comparative studies. But social interaction is absolutely pers pervasive. Um, every cognitive mechanism can be put into the service of some social aims and can have some social content. You know, we talk about attention, perception, memory, learning, but you can also see how these general cognitive processes are put into the service of social cognition. And furthermore, you don't even have to be social to use social cognition. Here's an example um, of a red-footed tortoise who is one of the least social animals that exist, living in almost complete isolation. And yet there was an interesting experiment that showed that these animals can solve a detour problem by observing a conspecific. They could not solve this problem if it was not shown to them by another tortoise, uh, you know, how to exactly do, solve this detour problem. And they lear learned very, very quickly in this observation trial. <coughs> now, we, we can contrast learning by trial and error, a sort of classical learning and learning by observing others and say, well, what are the benefits? First of all, a wonderful benefit is that we don't need to make our own mistakes. And we can learn a lot of things, the value of things, the value of places, the value of actions. We can learn about people. And very interestingly, by ob observing others, we get an extra benefit because others have already filtered out the most important features for learning so that learning can be extra fast. So the social in social cognition is probably about tuning into others and the cognitive is all the classical mechanisms we know classical learning which are being used in not just human beings but in in all mammals and even beyond that i'm giving you a very powerful social stimulus and there it goes again <laughs> but um the point of this is that the brain reacts very quickly to the expression of fear in another person. And this is true, even when we are not aware of seeing the stimulus picture. That's why I took it away quite quickly again. But your amygdala should have been just a tiny bit activated by this shocking picture, funny shocking picture. The brain prioritizes this particular emotion and we automatically share the emotion. So here is an experiment that was already published in 1998, which shows that, first of all, we feel the fear of another. When we see a, a fearful face, we will can demonstrate that the brain has a fear response. And secondly, the study showed that even if that fearful face was then masked by a neutral face, so that you were not aware of seeing the fearful face, the brain reacted in this manner. Now, we can learn fear by observing another person learning. So here is an interesting experiment by uh, Olson uh, carried out in the lab of Liz Phelps, where um, on the left side you can see an observer. This is a learner. He just watches a video and he sees the expressive face of a person who is given an electric shock when a certain stimulus appears. And this face, this fearful, distressed face, acts as an unconditioned stimulus just as much as if this observer were getting the electric shock. The amygdala is activated through this observational learning just as much as through the original classical conditioning. And this response can be modulated both by mirror and mentalizing networks. But I will talk more about this later. Now, very interestingly, already in the 1980s, there was an, in, an experiment how, about how um, tame uh, monkeys, not monkeys in the wild, um, in the lab, monkeys learn to be afraid of snakes. It turned out that 
uh, monkeys um, weren't in initially afraid of snakes. In fact, not afraid at all. Uh, these, were, these were rubber snakes, by the way. Um, and uh, the experimenters gave them a video to watch of another monkey being afraid of, indeed, this rubber snake. And again, this image of another monkey being afraid of the snake acts as an unconditioned stimulus for the observer monkey, and in very, very few trials, they learn to be afraid. But this is very fast learning because the fear of snakes is already pre-prepared in the monkey's brain. So they couldn't learn to be afraid of a flower, which was also done by careful cutting of the video where the snake, the rubber snake, was replaced by a flower. Now, let's talk a little bit more about learning by observation, or we might call it social learning. So one particularly uh, pervasive phenomenon is, is that we, we go where others go. That's already the beginning. This is not just human beings, but you can see this phenomenon when going to restaurants. And of course, the uh, manager of restaurants uh, know, know, knows very well that when, they, when, when the restaurant is empty and the first customers come, he should put them in the window so that other customers will be attracted. And of course, we also do what others do, and we learn to perform actions from others. We learn to do them in a particular way, and we like what others like. So there is really this social transmission of values and preferences, and this occurs not just in humans, but also in many other species. It also occurs in very young children. There is, for example, this nice experiment with three-year-olds who were given little vignettes um, of, of, a, of a int being introduced to the photo of a child who then says, my name is Jordan, I love playing kasoop. Kasoop is my favourite thing to play, and so on. And what happens in the experiment is that the three-year-olds tend to choose novel toys with these unknown names, or foods, or games, or clothes that are endorsed by children of the same age, of the same sex. So they do what others do, they believe themselves to be similar to. And of course, it's also true in birds. Um, there are very sophisticated studies that uh, show that it's not just that one bird flies to where other birds are, just like humans go to the restaurant where there are other customers, but birds can actually be induced to disregard their own information, like where the food really is, and make an incorrect choice when they're provided with incorrect but apparently convincing social information. A lot of other birds at a place where, in fact, they should know there is no food. Now, here is a very interesting uh, aspect of social learning, uh, which gives us a first idea of a strict separation between humans and uh, non-human species. And this is um, called over-imitation. In fact, on the web where I got this slide from, it is called the mystery of over-imitation. Why is it a mystery? Well, look at the puzzle box in the middle. It's a very uh, strange uh, contraption where uh, in the middle there is a little uh, reward that can be got. And in fact, it can be got quite easily, quite directly by poking inside. But this is not what the experimenter demonstrates. The experimenter does a lot of irrational actions, unnecessary actions. As you can slightly see on this box, he taps on the top, he takes little tools and he goes on and eventually he, he makes a movement that gets the reward. Now, when children observe this, uh, they copy these unnecessary actions in opening the puzzle box. They assume that the adult must have a good reason. And in fact, um, older children also do this and even adults do this, and the usual answer when they when they are asked to explain why they are copying all these actions, then they say this is the way to do it, or this is how we do it, um, indicating that this is perhaps a very important tool um, to build group identity and in fact cultural differences. Now, interestingly, 
uh, chimpanzees, when they are faced with the demonstration of the puzzle box and all these unnecessary actions, do not copy these unnecessary actions. They go straight to the reward and really, in this respect, seem to be much cleverer than humans. Now, I said already that for social learning, we need to tune into others. We need to be aware that there are others to, uh, to some extent so that we know where to learn from. But how do we do this tuning in? And here is an, an example. Um, we, we see a very strong stimulus, a face. And we are very sensitive to understanding, to knowing when somebody makes eye contact with us. You can tell whether she is looking at you. And also you can tell when somebody is calling you. We did an experiment where we um, uh, compared and contrasted all these factors, looking at you, not looking at you, as here, and calling your name, hey, John, and calling somebody else's name. So all of these contrasts allowed us to see what kind of um, main regions would be particularly active just at this moment when there is a communication forthcoming, some ostensive signal like your name being called or you're being directly looked at. And indeed, it is part of the social brain that's ready to get uh, to receive a communication, still no content whatsoever in the communication, but a readiness to receive. And the main areas are medial prefrontal cortex and the temporal pole, regions that are equally active when it's either calling your name or uh, looking at you directly. Now, there is an interesting side effect of our sensitivity to social um, uh, signals, particularly to the ostensive signals of somebody looking at you. This is a, a, a really a, a one of our favorite um, experiments in social psychology, which was carried out in the departmental coffee room. And as you know, there are always people who don't quite pay enough money for their milk. So what to do about this? In fact, the experiment has placed pictures above the box where the money has to be put. In one week, it was a pair of eyes. In another week, it was a, a strip of flowers. And you can see here very clearly the amount of money paid per milk, liter of milk consumed. Quite a lot of money when these rather angry eyes were shown. <laughs> Not a lot when these flowers were shown. Not that much when these slightly not directly looking at your eyes were shown. But look at this. Every time when there were eyes, more money was put in the box. Of course, the people were completely unaware that this experiment was actually being done. It just shows these very subtle and yet strong effects of uh, being <coughs> tuned in to these uh, social signals that come from other people. So how is it that we can learn so easily from others? Well, perhaps we can say that learning by observation is essentially copying. And automatic and effortless copying is due to the brain's mirror system, um, originally discovered by Rizzolatti and uh, colleagues and intensively investigated ever since. The uh, mirror system um, is engaged when we observe the action of another person and again these same regions are activated when we act ourselves. So this provides a mechanism of how we can understand the meaning of actions, our own and those of other people. And this kind of copying, this kind of imitation after the strong tuning in has amazingly strong pro-social benefits. So we do get um, an alignment with the group. We uh, find that there is a sharing of experiences, for example, empathy. People, um, after being imitated uh, by another person, will move closer to them. People, after being imitated by another person surreptitiously, will actually show increased liking for that person. They will also show increased helpfulness. And even when they then um, have to pay for a meal, they become 
more generous when giving tips, a quite indirect effect. It's not as if they were directly repaying a compliment to the person who surreptitiously imitates them. Now, there is a particularly nice experiment by van Baren where he compared and contrasted a person being imitated and not imitated. Um, here he lured the participants to the um, lab on, on a pure pretense. They had to fill in questionnaires and they did that. And after finishing this, they were each paid um, two uh, euro. And then they left. And when leaving the room, casually, there was a little charity box to put some money in. In fact, it was a made-up charity. Uh, they, they, it was called the Mediclowns, as if they were clowns who were doing some nice things for children in hospital. And what happened was that the donations of the people who had been imitated, without their knowing this, were much more generous. They gave more money compared to the people who had not been imitated by the experimenter. And even this increased liking occurs, was demonstrated in monkeys. They also prefer people who imitate them. As you can see, there is an, a, a significant effect, uh, which is shown in the monkeys moving closer to the person who imitate them than to one who did not imitate them. And they were also more likely to share their food with them, which is quite something for a monkey. So we're talking about, um, still about this tuning in system, the uh, mirror neuron system, and we have to consider these terms resonance and contagion and imitation, different forms of being aligned with others, being in tune with others. And here is an experiment that suggests that we really share the experience of touch it's not as if we can be completely neutral observers, see somebody being touched and nothing happens in our brain at all. It uh, appears that there is the, in this case, somatosensory uh, cortex is active when observing someone else being touched, the same area that is also active when we ourselves are being touched. And this was an experiment where, of course, uh, head and, um, and uh, I think, uh, lamps were being compared and also touching on the head and touching on the neck were being compared. Again, slightly different regions of somatosensory cortex were being active when, when it was head versus neck. Now, what about empathy? I've already mentioned it a little bit and it is an incredibly important concept for us all. Um, it's the kind of um, concept that many people feel, well, we, we should really um, use neuroscience to to perhaps find some application uh, for, for the good of, of society. Now, contagion is far more complex than is, is normally seen. It's, it's not just contagion. Maybe a first step is contagion. Yes, it is sharing another person's distress, but it's also being a bit distanced from this and not imitating the expression of another person, but doing actually something complementary, something that might be called consoling in this particular case, which is a quite different action. So when you see and you have empathy with another person, the, the, the response is not to just be, um, be sharing this and imitate the expression. You are doing other things. See on this uh, 19th century, a uh, very touching picture uh, of course, in, in Victorian London, where there is this beggar boy with torn clothes, very poor, bare feet, he has a fiddle. There you see a rich girl with shoes and a sort of velvet dress. Now, what story is behind this, we don't know, but she's obviously in, in amazing distress. And the, the, the very nice thing is that this poor boy, even, you know, so he's probably very, very far below in social status to her, can do something for her and can give, through his empathy, uh, something um, very important uh, to a fellow human being. Now, I must mention the uh, study of empathy that was carried out by uh, Tanya Singer and, and Chris, um, which was uh, built on, on uh, studying how people can share the pain of another. So here were couples, one of the couple in the scanner, the other one outside, and uh, 
uh, pain was administered to the both to the person in the scanner and sometimes to the person outside. And there were uh, a very clever manipulations so that you could anticipate which of these two would happen. Would the person in the scanner show empathy? And here is the summary picture, which I think shows how very clearly pain for self and other is represented in a very similar way in the anterior cingulate cortex here. As you can see, the red line is um, the activation um, when there is pain administered to the self, the person in the scanner, and the green line refers to pain being administered to the person outside the scanner, so it was not felt by the person in the scanner, but yet this particular region of the social brain responded just as much. Now, here is, of course, a very classic sculpture to, um, to elicit empathy and empathic response. This is a, 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 um, all well known to you. Um, but there is an interesting twist because it turns out, social psychologists have shown this, that your empathic response to the sight of another person in pain is actually greatly enhanced if that person is in eye contact with you. And so here is a, an attempt to show that it might even be arousing stronger empathy in, in, in you for Laocon. So um, the experiment uh, by Bavelas um, used, again, a, a typical trick, um, the, uh, inviting the participants in the experiment to be in a waiting room for the experiment to start, but of course the real experiment happened right then when they were in the waiting room. When they were waiting there, some uh, people, trained actors, a couple came in carrying a very heavy television set and uh, one of them managed to drop this onto the hand of the other actor. Of course, it was only pretense, but still the actor managed to give a very uh, persuasive expression of pain. They videoed the face of the person in the waiting room, the subject, and of course, uh, very often, there was an expression of pain shown um, but this expression was very strongly enhanced when there was eye contact with the actor who felt the pain and the person. So the question that we are asking really is, we really probably do this enhancement because we want to communicate that we are empathic people. It's not enough to have empathy. We want to show that we show empathy. And in case you, you can't read this cartoon, Perhaps you can read it. So it says, before you continue your emotional tirade, let me know if you're picking up on my non-evaluative and empathetic listening. So it is true. We can turn emotional res resonance up or down. We can even suppress it. And this suggests that there are strong top-down influences on the uh, mirror system. And in fact, these top-down influences are not always to the good, as it were. They can be to the bad. And I just want to give a tiny little bit about the dark side of our social brain. So we can suppress empathy when we are faced with a member of an outgroup. And I will show you a quite shocking experiment um, that was done with um, either Caucasian participants or Chinese participants and they all saw the same videos of either Caucasian faces or of Chinese faces. And in each case the contrast was between a needle, nastily, being poked into the face of the person or a little cotton bud touching the cheek. So this is needle, this is uh, non-painful touching, the same with the Chinese face. So the shocking result is, is down below. Um, it turns out that the Caucasian subjects showed this response in the anterior cingulate cortex. I've shown you the picture before of the um, uh, reaction to pain experiment. They show it only for the Caucasian faces. Look at this. Hardly, hardly at all for the Chinese faces. Really uh, extraordinary. And exactly the reverse was found in Chinese subjects. So they showed very strong 
response in the anterior cingulate cortex when there was a painful stimulus administered to the Chinese person. And look at this, practically nothing when this was a Caucasian person. So exactly the reverse in these uh, two groups. This experiment has been replicated and indeed there, are, there is research uh, which, which is going on not just in China but in Oahu, so they're trying to exchange uh, ideas about cultural effects and so on. And um, I'm, I'm glad and relieved to say that yes, you can change this. The empathic response to a member of an outgroup can be reinstated and this can very much be done as you would expect by uh, familiarity with individuals in this outgroup. If you become uh, interested in them and you know them as individuals, you will show the empathy response. So you can overcome uh, this particular uh, dark side of the social brain. Now, I do want to say a little bit more about explicit and implicit processes in copying. Um, Top-down influences can overcome hostility against the outgroup. Perhaps you're being given a, a, a speech by somebody that tells you you should overcome the hostility, you're reading something about it, or you're just putting your intention to a more um, human, <laughs> uh, inclusive outlook. And it is also true that these top-down influences can change the pro-social effects and make us actually more selfish than we would otherwise be. And one very interesting example, I think, between the switch from implicit to explicit is when we become aware of being copied. This has always absolutely fascinated me because there seems to be a sudden transformation of the pro-social effects of implicit information, imitation into something that we hate, that is mocking. And we all know we don't want to be imitated. It's absolutely a hostile act as soon as we become aware of it. Now, what is special about explicit processes? And one immediate um, answer might be, ah, that these are the ones, these are the processes perhaps specific to humans, but not necessarily. Um, it is, we, we don't really know. It's very difficult to study uh, this in, in any uh, human being who doesn't have language. It's difficult to study it in other social animals. And of course, it's difficult to study in prelinguistic infants. Now, in, in humans, explicit processes are underpinned by language and they are closely linked to metacognition. Um, which I translate loosely as thinking about thoughts or having a, a theory of mind. And I will say something very um, brief about a theory of mind in its explicit and implicit forms, because it is time to unconfound the processes that are currently assumed under theory of mind and mentalizing, and we, we never know uh, which part people are actually talking about. So. Just very briefly, what is theory of mind or TOM or mentalizing? And it's basically the idea that we attribute mental states to others, what they know, what they think, what they feel or desire to predict or to explain what they are doing. But it leaves completely open whether we are aware of this attribution. We might be or we might not be. And here is, is, is a classic task, the so-called Salian test, which is a, an absolutely paradigmatic, explicit task. The children have to uh, say where Sally will think her marble is. And because of the scenario, the way it is played out, Sally has a false belief. She thinks her marble is in the basket. Now... Children of around the age of five can easily pass this task, but it does take them quite a long time. First of all, they can't give the correct answer, and then very quickly there is the probability of finding any child um, uh, with about aged about uh, 60 months or five years who will pass this task. And they won't just give the right answer, but they will give you the perfect justification. They say, Sally couldn't know that her marble is, is no longer in the basket. She wasn't there when Naughty Anne took it out of the basket. So it's absolutely there. 
and it's very, very explicit. Now, I'm going to show you also the case of um, autism, where there is a very, very big delay, um, but slowly, 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 the probability increases, and eventually, at about 10 years or later, now we're a bit too fast on that, I hope there was a... Yes, we can not quite, I have to say, what I see on my screen is not what you see here. At about 10 years, they also, almost all, managed to solve this task in an explicit way. And here is some data on five different cultures doing this type of task, the Salian task, and many other false belief tasks. The uh, cultures of Canada, Samoa, India, Peru, and you see there is this increase, this is the average, and again, it's about 60 months when, on average, children succeed in, in this task. But now we know from more recent research that 15 months old babies show evidence of using mental states to predict where an actor will reach for a hidden toy um, when we use looking time to understand children's cognition. This was uh, first shown in, in an absolutely um, groundbreaking paper by Onisha and Bayajan in 2005. But very recently, um, Kovacs and others showed that infants as young as seven months already have an implicit understanding of a protagonist's false belief. So the first problem we have to explain is why children solve this salient task, this false belief task, which is supposed to tap their ability to mentalize only by age four or six. And I would think we should consider the difference between implicit and explicit mentalizing here. And the second problem is to explain what it means that autistic children are able to solve the Salian task from age 10 onwards when they still have the same impairments in social communication that actually the mentalizing failure is supposed to explain. Again, I would like you to consider the difference between implicit and explicit forms of mentalizing. And very briefly, I will tell you about an experiment with autistic adults who all passed a large battery of explicit false belief tasks. They were very able and they were totally uh, au fait with all the right answers they knew about uh, mental states. And they were shown a video of an implicit false belief task as it was developed in the infant lab. Actually, this is the paradigm. And you can see the Salian task being played out by this little teddy who plays the role of Anne, while the observer behind the screen is uh, playing the role of Sally. So the teddy puts a ball into a box. This is actually a first habituation trial. Where will, where will she reach? Of course, that's where she will reach. And there is another such habituation trial so that the infant will uh, be prepared to look towards the window, anticipates where the person will reach. So now it's the other box. And you have to remember this is constructed for very young children and therefore it's really, really slow. Where will she reach? You know, here. So you should already look there. I think we now come to the test, test trial. And again, I think it is a bit excruciatingly slow. <laughs> there are several different types of test trials, but this is one where the ball is transferred in full view into the other box. You know it's a ball, she knows it's a ball, Teddy knows it's a ball. There you go. All covered up. Goodbye, yes. <laughs> now, she is no longer looking. She's been distracted by a telephone noise which you couldn't hear. Look what he does, he takes it out 
In fact, in this test trial, he takes it completely away. Now, where, <laughs> where would you reach? You should anticipate, just like you anticipated with the earlier trials. Now, it was a bit daring to use this kind of infant uh, appropriate video with adults, but it worked with adults. These are neurotypical adults. They anticipate the correct target. People with autism Asperger syndrome did not anticipate the correct target. They did their very first look was not with preferentially to the correct target, but the neurotypical people did look to the correct target. So I think we concluded that. The, um, these very able autistic people who had explicit theory of mind did not have the implicit form of theory of mind. It remains impaired. And this is very fascinating because um, I think most of the time we would, we would actually assume that you need this implicit underpinning before you can have something explicit on top. Awareness should be sort of like of a little bit of something that you're not aware of, but apparently not, not in the least. The iceberg analogy completely breaks down here. You can have just the top and nothing underneath. And I think there is something very interesting. How, how good is it for you to have this explicit mentalizing? Is it just completely cosmetic? Does it mean nothing at all? But no, I think it is actually very conferring benefits to, uh, to the autistic people um, because we can see that their uh, everyday life is still very impaired because that's where you have to make these very, very fast decisions. But when they are writing, especially when they're writing about their own thoughts, they seem to be able to do that and have, seem to have some insight, which is, which is very, very often in contrast with their very poor um, uh, interaction in ordinary life. And indeed, we should ask the question, how does mentalizing, especially this explicit mentalizing, benefit uh, our learning from others? Does it give us something extra? And I think, yes, it does, because humans can do even better than learning by observation. They can learn by instruction. So I gave you the example of fear conditioning right at the beginning. And of course, you can do much better than ask somebody to observe what happens and acquire this fear by observation. You can just tell that person, whenever you choose the blue square, you will get a painful electric shock. An explicit rule which makes you quite sure that you will never choose the blue square. So you learn very efficiently, very, very fast. And this is, is just an idea of, of, of a picture illustrating um, this sort of typified learning by instruction. We have an of explicit of ostensive gesture, the pointing stick, or, you know, in my case, this laser pointer. It does seem to be very useful. And this uh, joint attention, again, very explicit to where the teacher points. These are obviously engineering students who are being uh, taught about some very important aspect of this uh, building of a bridge. So ostensive gestures are often studied as totally implicit things like the automatic eyebrow flash or the direct looking at a person. But it is very important to realize that ostensive gestures can also be explicit uh, as when I use this pointer. That's something quite deliberate. And these deliberate uh, communicative acts, I think, are different from the implicit communication that is seen in the publicly available information which is used even by the red-footed tortoise. So they learn by observation, as it were, because it's information that's available there anyway. The demonstrator tortoise did not particularly want to communicate that knowledge. And it is, I think, the basis for not just uh, teaching in a spontaneous sense or in the sense of natural pedagogy, as proposed in a very interesting way by Gergely Sibra, um, but it's formal teaching that's so interesting. And I think it's this that enables humans to build more accurate models of the world. So explicit communication and teaching, I would propose, are uniquely form, uh, human forms of social cognition. 
uh, I think human beings are the only species who teach deliberately. There is a lot of argument about whether there aren't other species who also teach, but it does seem not quite the same kind of deliberate teaching over and above learning from others by observation. So while listening to me, you have been using social and cognitive processes and many of those we share with other species, but you've also been using some social processes that might be unique to humans, like tracking my thoughts. And thank you for doing so.